30. Very good morning, everyone, and very warm welcome to the newest edition of our web series, Liberties in Lockdown. The series where the European Liberal Forum is trying to investigate a little bit deeper what the COVID-19 crisis is doing with our lives, our personal freedom, and our liberties. I'm Daniel Kavik, I'm the Executive Director of the European Liberal Forum, and I thank you very much for letting us um, yeah, in to your living rooms, your studies, but maybe even your offices um, after the lockdowns have been lifted a little bit in Brussels and beyond. Um, I said a little bit about the Liberties in Lockdown series. Today we're going to talk about what does COVID-19 do with arts, the cultural sector. That's why we choose the title um, Lights, Camera, Lockdown, COVID-19 and the Arts. The arts sector, the creative industry has been very hard hit by the crisis and a lot of measures were designed to help independent workers, entrepreneurs, but very often let out, more or less explicitly, creative workers, people who work in the arts. This, these are a couple of things that we will be talking about. We have a fantastic panel here today. Thank you so much for joining us here. And we also have a fantastic moderator today, uh, Ismaya, who is not only our moderator today, but also um, a member of the board of directors of ELF and our treasurer. And of course, you know that ELF is the political foundation and the think tank of the ALDE party. Amongst many, many other things of being the international secretary of the Estonian Reform Party, Iris Meyer is also a policy advisor in the European Parliament. And I will be quiet now and hand over the floor to Iris. Thank you very much again for letting us in this morning. Thank you very much to the panel. And thank you very much, Iris, for taking the floor this morning. Uh, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, everybody. 29 participants so far. I think that some uh, more will join us. I hope so. Uh, we will, I will start uh, with a very brief um, explanation of the house rules of uh, today's debate. Um, first of all, this, um, please be aware that this online event will be recorded and it will be shared on social media channels and on our ELF website. Uh, secondly, uh, we will open the webinar uh, Q&A section. Um, and uh, this we will use uh, to organize votes if you ever get to that part, uh, but also to accept your written questions. Uh, so you will be, and you will be also able to vote uh, for the questions that already posed what, what you really like to get uh, answer uh, to. So uh, please um, use this opportunity. And if time allows, uh, we may also take interventions from the audience, but I can't guarantee that. And third, please to tweet, please to share, please to ask questions and uh, be live with us. So having said th so that, I will now very briefly uh, give a little bit of um, a frame for this discussion with a couple of forwards. And um, this is also for the background uh, information of the sector as, as such. So, uh, on one hand, of course, the digital giants such as Netflix, Apple TV, Disney, Spotify, you name it, they're expanding. On the other hand, national singers, actors, they're performing for free, if at all. And this is really the contradiction in the cultural sector in the COVID-19 era. According to the Eurostat 2017 statistics, so a few years back, but that is the most um, precise statistics, um, in the EU, there was 1.1 million cultural enterprises, which generated more than 145 billion value-added euros. This is equivalent to 2.3% of the non-financial business economy total, and it represents approximately 5% of all enterprises within the non-financial business economy. Just as a comparison, for example, uh, motor trade sector or the chemical production manufacturing is not that big. The cultural sector's turnover was 375 billion, which presented 1.5% of the total turnover generated within the EU's non-financial business economy. So this is a statistics on the Eurostat. You can always go back and uh, go there and uh, have a look more of the, of the numbers if you're interested. 
And then we go for the employment part. In 2018, there were 8.7 million people across the EU working in a cultural activity or the cultural occupation. And uh, they formed then equivalent to 3.8% of the total number of persons employed within the whole EU economy. 3.8%, that's a lot of people. And of course, the problem is that many of, of, of them are classified as micro and small enterprises. It's not a problem for, uh, for us or for them in a way, but, but uh, we will uh, discuss this a little bit later. What are the challenges if you are a um, micro or small enterprise, especially on COVID-19 and very dependent on your audience, often physical audience. Um, unfortunately, regardless of uh, this economic value this sector brings, uh, cultural creative players are really lacking the stability and full legal protection. It is in many ways a very atypical sector and it's made out of players with already fragile foundations. As I said, they have often very small structures and irregular income and uh, this uh, COVID-19 and the period of confinement um, will have a very long lasting negative effect. We will see also what are the opportunities later, but it's uh, for the moment negative effect to the cultural creative production and revenue, but also not to mention that it has some effect to our cultural diversity because a lot of performers are not able to uh, perform and uh, films cannot be shot and so on. Um, notably, the situation in every member state is different and overall estimated loss for the European cultural creative sector might reach really 100 billion euros or more. Uh, there is also spillover effect um, to the other sectors such as tourism and transport. And uh, we know that tourism accounts about 10.3% of the European Union GDP and 40% of uh, is associated with the culture. Um, and moreover, we can say that three out of four Europeans choose the destination by taking into account the cultural offer available. Uh, performances, um, cultural heritage sites, and so on. Um, often the cultural creative industry is considered as a little bit elitist. So uh, we see in the European Parliament, sometimes we have to explain that even we like really good books and watch really good movies, we also do a real politics and really bring GDP. I mean, not me, but for example, Paulette, <laughs> who is a performer herself. Um, and it's uh, considered a little bit elitist, but it's uh, actually high time that the uh, European Union starts taking and defining this um, uh, sector as a strategic one for our economy and for our uh, citizens. Because of course, um, there is an economic part in it, but of course, um, this is also a culture, is also a determining factor for our culture, European societies and values really. And um, this is, I stop here. I will now introduce our speakers, free speakers, who will then um, give their own intro in, um, introduction of the topic and I hope that um, later we can discuss about uh, several parts of uh, my four words but also the speaker's uh, contributions. So first of all I would like to introduce you Irina Jovova who is a member of the European Parliament in the Renew Europe group. Uh, she was elected as a member of the European Parliament 2019 and she is a vice coordinator of the Culture and Education Committee and um, the, I mean, she has many other tasks, but that's the main task, I would say, for, <laughs> in the context of today. And um, she's a Slovenian, and she worked as a journalist for, for many years before becoming an MEP. Then we have Osa. Am I correct with <laughs> your name? Your last name is, uh, it's, uh, she's uh, Icelandic, so I really apologize already before that maybe I'm not able to pronounce uh, the name correctly. Uh, Richard Stotti. Yeah, more or less, okay. <laughs> so uh, she is a secretary general for the International Network for Contemporary Performing Arts uh, since March, 2019. And, uh, but she's been active uh, for this um, network already since 1999. And Osa is, um, has a very distinguished career in performing arts, culture, academia, banking, politics, media, very wide, um, wide scope as well. Uh, and then uh, thirdly, we have uh, Paulette Kasha, yes, correct, yes, uh, and she is a professional dance artist. Uh, she will uh, uh, give us a little bit her own insight, um, how is this crisis uh, from the point of view of artists. And um, she is now Berlin-based freelance dance artist and collaborating with different choreographers and collectives from the International Contemporary Art Science. 
So um, not wasting more time for introduction, I will give a floor to uh, five to maximum seven minutes to Irina now, please. Hello, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, so uh, good morning. I uh, woke up not so long ago, so I hope you don't mind. I will drink my big cup of coffee <laughs> in between. Um, first, of course, I would like to thank the European Liberal Forum for uh, inviting me to this debate. Um, hello also to all the participants. I am really very um, honored and happy to be here with you to be able to speak, but also to listen to, which is probably even more important to me uh, at the moment about such, um, such a crucial issue um, uh, of which unfortunately not all are aware of, of the importance of the um, cultural creative sector, um, especially but not only in these, uh, in these times. Um, so as you uh, probably already know and Iris already said, I am a member of three committees, but my primary, if I may say so, pr my primary one is the cult committee. One of the reasons is because I was a journalist before for eight years, but um, the second one, probably the most, the more essential one, is um, because I think that culture is really underestimated and um, malnourished on all areas of the sector. And I'm not saying this in a sense of what culture and arts give to us, I'm saying this in a sense of what um, we give to them. Uh, because the sector is, in my opinion, often unjustifiably um, the last thing we think about. Um, and this goes also sometimes for the politics, just to be clear, I'm not going to make any excuses because this is often felt in um, the member states. I mean, um, not everyone, but um, unfortunately, this is the case in Slovenia, where I come from, at least um, at this moment, because um, you know, everything else is more important because culture just exists and that's just it. Um, it's not, it shouldn't be. Um, so I will just shortly describe the current situation here in Slovenia, I'm in Ljubljana at the moment. Um, because, you know, when I was preparing and I, when I was reading the materials, um, again, now these days for the debate, I was, every time I was trying to to look for the additional steps or the measures that Slovenian Ministry of Culture took um, on the European level, of course. So I don't know, did they ask for additional funds or uh, replacements or, uh, I don't know, from different programs and mechanism for CCS? Um, or did they at least speak with the Slovenian um, cultural workers, the stakeholders? Um, they didn't, obviously. Um, the Slovenian Minister of Culture is actually nowhere to be seen or heard um, and the cultural workers are actually protesting. Um, for three weeks in a row now, uh, they protested for the third time um, yesterday actually in front of the Ministry for Culture and if they protest and the Minister does not react, um, then you know that the situation here with culture is really getting worse and worse, um, unfortunately. Uh, unlike the minister, we, and when I say we, I mean me and my team, and of course the European Parliament and the Renew Europe group as such, and the, also the European Commission, especially uh, the Commission as Breton and um, Gabriel, I think that we are um, doing as much as we can on the European level, um, only um, on the issue of uh, the cultural sector, in between the pandemic, me and my colleagues wrote to the Commission quite a couple of times. I am a co-signer of five letters and three questions to the Commission um, and also a co-signer and I was actively involved in the um, petition. Um, of course, we also proposed measures and as a Renew Europe group, we are working on a paper of um, the European cultural recovery. So some of the things were already done and are still um, in the working phase, but um, it's only a start um, because we all know that the uh, cultural sector was among the first that started suffering and will probably be the last to get back on track, if I may say so. Um, I will just firstly say what should not be done for the cultural sector, that's budget cuts. Um, it's unacceptable for me um, and also postponing of the problems is unacceptable. 
So what should be done, I don't usually make promises, even though I'm a politician, uh, but in this case, I will uh, make a promise that me and my colleagues who are also very, we have a lot of, um, I have a lot of colleagues, MEPs from different groups that are really very engaged in this. So we will do whatever we can to get at least some extra percentage for the cultural sector uh, from the budget, but you know, no cuts. I think that this is going to be our main goal um, during the next weeks, at least. Um, also, I think that the current work plan for culture, which is from 2000, uh, 2019 to 2022, is going to be um, updated or needs to be updated because, you know, because of the pandemic and the consequences, but I repeat, not updated with cuts uh, in the funds. Um, I'm sure we will talk about the importance of the flexibility and about, I don't know, different mechanisms um, Corona response investment initiative or the share mechanism or the European um, uh, guarantee fund or the different platforms. But as I'm running out of time, I will just sum up with uh, the main um, concrete idea, um, what to do to promote culture and to encourage citizens to participate even more in the cultural um, events. Because, you know, we all know people have been um, put on hold from work and uh, many of them unfortunately lost their jobs due to quarantine. So um, probably a lot of them will start thinking in a, a crisis management way and um, they will start saving money. So they will, you know, not easily dedicate it um, to culture. So uh, it's kind of understandable, of course, but I think that the key is uh, to improve the situation in the cultural sector um, with, I mean, we have to at least return the visits and the interests at least to the same level as they were before. Um, so, um, I mean, I know that we cannot just say, okay, uh, we have a problem in the culture, you have to, I don't know, go uh, visit a museum or a theater, uh, but I think we can at least encourage them with, um, I don't know, um, a, a stimulation such as voucher. Um, I think this would work really good. Um, in Slovenia, some of this is probably some of the rare good things that's going on right now. We will get a voucher. Uh, it's going to be 200 euros for each adult citizen, but it's go only going to be for the accommodation, for the tourism. And Iris already said how much culture means also for the tourism. So I think that the vouchers should also be Mm, you know, applicable or the citizens should be able to use the vouchers for the culture. So I think this is an idea that is really concrete and, um, you know, the decision makers, at least in Slovenia, forgot, uh, as I just said, uh, the statistics that some regions really rely heavily on, on cultural tourism. Um, I'm sure we will all agree that if, when, then now is the time to realize the importance and the multiplicative effects um, of culture, also on the economy. So um, it should also be important for the people that don't care about culture, but do care about business. Um, we will all have to use these circumstances to give the cultural sector the pedestal that it deserved already before, but now uh, I think that even more. Um, I think that culture needs encouragement and care and constant presence. Um, and the gift of art and the need for it is what um, separates us from other beings. So we need an awareness, a general one, that culture is not an expense of the humanity. And the reason for it is simple. It's called public interest. Um, so I will finish uh, at this moment and I'm looking forward to the other speakers in the debate. Thank you very much, Irina. It was very interesting. I uh, had a uh... I actually wrote down at least four questions I would like to pose you, but I think the time is, uh, we are quite tight, so I will keep these uh, questions for later for the debate. And uh, meanwhile, I will uh, give a floor to Osa for the Thank introductory you. comments, please. Osa. Thank you very much. And first of all, I wanted to say, Irena, that many of the things that you said, we are experiencing as well, and it resonates very well with what we are hearing and seeing. And I want to take the opportunity to thank the Culture Committee, you and your fellow members for your important work. Secondly, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. It's very important and valuable for us in the sector to have dialogues with politicians and policymakers from all spectrums of the European political community. I'm going to frame my short intervention within the performing arts sector 
uh, but it resonates with the rest of the sector, most of the things that I have to say. But as has been stated, uh, the sector has suffered greatly during COVID time, not only huge economic losses, but also its most unique asset, which is the direct in the moment connection with audience and society. But at the same time, we in ITM, which is by far the largest performing arts ne network in Europe, we have been seeing and experiencing admirable resilience and resourcefulness by artists and organizations across the world and a very tangible solidarity within the sector. We are, however, going to be seeing, and it's already happening, organizations going under, we are seeing large numbers of artists and cultural professionals being unemployed, some with and some without benefits. And we could see a severely weakened sector in the years to come. Unless we roll up our sleeves and do something structured and systematic about it together. And I will suggest some routes regarding that in a minute. When it comes to employment, the European Performing Arts is the largest subsector in the culture and creative field. We have more than 1.2 million people working in theatre, dance, circus and other forms of artistic performance. And the sector is very composed of a flux of permanently hired people with a very, very strong presence of freelancers who come into institutions and work there as well as create their own work. The performing arts provide more than one job in six in the whole CCS ecosystem. It is by nature a very labor intensive sector and 78% of the employees are creators and performers. ITM has been surveying and researching the sector intensively in COVID time. And through all this, we've discovered various dangerous trends and here are a few. There is insufficient or no support for the independent art scene in some countries in Central and Eastern Europe. There is insufficient or no funding for research and innovation projects in the arts, which would be the most relevant and feasible in the current situation. We are seeing very dangerous trends that the pan-European and international dimension of culture is under particular threat today, with policies going national. And lastly, there is no EU-wide framework coordinating the legislation related to the working conditions of artists and cultural workers. And it's on this last point that I want to concentrate my final minutes. The culture and creative sector have been increasingly recognized at the EU level for their significant contribution to various fields of social life, economic development and international relations. And these three elements are being named as key dimensions of the EU new agenda for culture. But there is hardly a EU wide debate on the issue and the efforts to address the actual social economic situation of artists and culture workers is very scattered and scarce. And this is one of the underlying reasons why artists and culture workers livelihood and professional futures is under particular threat today, because the ground is so weak in so many pockets of Europe. And moreover, we are seeing a very uneven landscape of support measures being taken by member states as Irena just talked about Slovenia, now in COVID time. And it's really been re revealing and deepening the existing gaps that were there before across Europe. So IATM is proposing and has already proposed this to uh, Madame Gabriel, the commissioner, along with several other cultural networks in Europe that the sector and the European institution jointly launched what we call the European Framework for the Status of Artists. Aim being to provide a set of principles and recommendations which would trigger legislative and non-legislative activity at the member state level on most crucial issues re regarding the social economic condition of artists, 
such as contracts, taxes, wages, social benefits, mobility issues, and many more. The European Pillar for Social Rights, which was started, I believe, in 2018, could serve as a starting point for a reflection on how to approach this important task. The EU framework for the status should allow for an exchange of best practices amongst member states and monitoring each other's processes. It should contribute towards strengthening the identity of artists as innovators, entrepreneurs, of artists having a stronger position to generate economic, social and artistic wealth. And last but not least, it should protect the livelihood of millions of workers in the EU and anchor the European culture dimension. The last attempt to address this at EU level was with the European Parliament resolution in 2007 on the social status of artists. So it's been a long time since it's been taken in a comprehensive way. One of the strongest liberals of Europe, Emmanuel Macron, has in a recent speech called for a boost to the position of artists in his own country and a culturally strong Europe. And we think it's high time and a great opportunity that the EU and the sector adopt a holistic approach to determine our social and economic position and embrace the culture and creative sector as a whole. So this is what I would like to say for now and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Osa. I um, marked down two of the keywords that hopefully we can uh, discuss later more. It's uh, research and uh, de development funding in arts and the European framework of status of artists. So we can actually have, uh, speak a little bit um, more about that later during the debate. But uh, now I would like to give a floor to Paulette. And uh, Paulette is giving us a little bit of insight um, how to be an artist in these times. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation for this talk. I really appreciate it. And let me thank you for your hard work to help our sector. Um, well, uh, I will only talk about my very personal experiences during this uh, lockdown as a dancer and a performer. Uh, I can say that it has been a very interesting and challenging period as mentally and physically as well. Uh, in the very beginning, I didn't really understand uh, how I will or how can I adapt to these new circumstances. Um, actually, I was on my way to Hungary to work on a project uh, when the travel ban uh, was made. And, um, but I was still very naive and I thought um, the project will happen and we will be premiering May. Well, this unfortunately didn't happen and uh, the project got postponed for next year. But uh, after this, I've been receiving emails and calls that all my upcoming works uh, are postponed or staying in hold. Um, and we are waiting to the moment to see when and how can we start to work again. Uh, yeah, it felt like the whole performing art, art field got frozen in a second and uh, our livelihood uh, got into danger. Um, but this was not only my worry, actually. Uh, as a performer, obviously, I'm working with my body. Uh, physical contact, like touches, are more necessary in this field. Uh, there are different norm in terms of physical contact in this field. So I couldn't even imagine how is it going to be now on, uh, after uh, COVID-19. Um, my body has to stay in shape because this is my tool. This is my working tool. So home office is not uh, an option for a performer. Uh, of course, there, there are and there were possibilities to attend uh, online trainings. Uh, but I can tell you, it's, it's not that easy to do the same things in your living room, what usually you do in a 100 plus square meter rehearsal studio. So it was uh, a, a really challenging uh, way also to, to, to accept this new situation and either fight against it and or, or uh, just um, understand it and to see how is it going to evolve. So it's not only affecting um, in a financial way, but also uh, in a professional career, 
uh, for performer artists, especially for dancers, this is a huge gap. Uh, months not being able to practice uh, as before, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a danger on our career. Dancers' career is already uh, much shorter than any other profession, so uh, it's a scary feeling to lose all these times um, um, during this period. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the possibility of changing careers as well, uh, or professions, came into many of our artists' minds. Uh, but uh, still, uh, I think, um, as personally, I can say that I'm really trying to make the best out of this time, and I try to use this period uh, not only worry about the future, but as well investing for my artistic approach. And I'm, I'm able to do things that I wasn't usually doing before or, uh, and yeah, and it's definitely in a, a it's a positive aspect as well. But in this other hand, it's really hard to stay motivated without knowing when can be again on stage or uh, when can, be uh, be presented. So when you have a goal and you know, at least you know that at a certain time you will be back on stage, then you work towards this uh, time. But with the unknown, it's really hard to uh, deal with. Um, and obviously performances need audiences and there are initiatives to move the performing art to the realm, uh, online realm. Uh, as for an audience uh, member, it can be even very uh, comfortable situation. You are able to attend these performances from your sofa, but just try to imagine uh, the artist aspect. It's uh, standing in front of an empty audience and being streamed. It's not the most uplifting feeling, I can tell. Um, so yeah, during this time, many, many questions were uh, and still are coming in my mind. and. Um, not really having the answer yet and um yeah as i said it's not just about thinking the financial part and thinking how i'm going to survive as an artist but also how i'm going to start or survive um in the private way how can i uh manage without this time you know improve as an artist or or of course everybody tries to invest this moment as well and, and reflect later on. I'm sure there are many artists who reflect on this period later in their works. But um, yeah, it, it has been not easy, I, I, can, I can tell. Thank you very much. I uh, also uh, actually wrote down a couple of, um, couple of uh, keywords, for example, the career which is um, hardly anybody who is just uh, uh, enjoying your art thinks about. Maybe we could understand that it's difficult to practice. And you know, I have been jogging and doing uh, heat training in my cellar, but uh, it's not the same uh, for you. I uh, am very aware, but of course, uh, thinking about this career, um, this is um, again, another eye opener because indeed, I mean, you already have a very limited time as a, as a dancer and you have to keep your body and mental and, and everything and uh, very sharp uh, all of this time. Well, um, I'm very happy for this uh, very, uh, very nice and um, maybe not uh, constructive in a way yet, but kind of framing <laughs> introductions. Um, I just would like to do some uh, warm up questions also to, to allow a little bit um, the, our um, audience virtual audience to, to, to uh, start asking questions. So the first warm-up question maybe for everybody would be that um, if you had to choose one or two or three adjectives that um, to describe this uh, COVID-19 crisis for artists and the creative industry in general, what would this be? Shortly, what, what, what would be the adjective? Maybe Paulette, you can start. Yes, um, I would say, uh, well, scary for sure. And uh, uh, instable, like, uh, and uh, yeah, that, that's what would I stay, say. But in the same time, it was um, also, yeah, unknown or, or like 
not knowing what's going on. It's, it's this curious, curiosity as well, in a way. Also, what, how do you, uh, how do, how would you describe this? Well, as personally, I would use cozy, but lonely. Ah. <laughs> uh, professionally, it's been a very hard time for our sector. And I can really echo what Paulette just said about, you know, that it's scary, it's, it's uncertain, it's, um, it poses a lot of questions. But at the same time, what we've been seeing, and I said about it, that, that the, the resil resilience and resourcefulness has been admirable. And we've been seeing so many new ideas coming up. So it, is, it has also been a period of reflection, slowing down, thinking our sector in a different way. And we actually in ITM had already planned long before COVID to have like a long trajectory project, which we call rewiring the network and the sector, which is a huge brainstorm that is going on throughout 2020 about how we want to see the performing arts evolve in the future. And uh, it just so happened that it was during this year now that we are doing this. Mm -hmm. And in there, we've been having thousands of ideas. So people have really been imaginative also in this hard time. So the creative sector has been very creative. <laughs> Even more have. creative, that's good. They enough. certainly have. <laughs> and Irina, how do you describe uh, the politician, it, the journalist? It's, it's very hard to add anything um, because I can only agree uh, and of course also understand my previous uh, two uh, speakers. Um, I would agree with scary and uncertain, but also, yes, I think that this is an opportunity. Um, for us as policymakers, maybe um, the reflection also in a way that we need to engage more with cultural workers because dialogue is also important. So I hope that we will all, um, that everyone in politics, especially some of the member states, um, because I think there's a bigger problem there than in the European Parliament or the Commission will uh, realize the importance of it. Mm -hmm. And this exactly brings me very um, uh, smoothly actually to the next question, which is a little bit more than uh, in a deeper in the politics. So the MFF, of course, is in uh, currently debated in a council and you briefly, Irina, also mentioned this. Uh, that would reduce the Creative Europe program compared to the previous MFF. And of course, this is not at all satisfactory solution um, because we asked at least doubling the budget, which is already was 0.14% on MFF. 0.14, but we provide, let's remind the numbers, 3.5% of the total employment. So it's just not balanced, yeah, already. Um, now is the question, should the EU receive um, uh, more powers? and more money as well then in this area in order to create more uniform response for these sectors for future crises or in general, let's say, what would be the added value for the greater EU role in a, in a culture? Should we go there, uh, getting more power for the EU in a, in, a, in a field of culture, then taking that also more money obviously needs to go and what would be the added value? So maybe Irina and then Nasa. Um, I think that we should or they should, the member states should at least think about the possibility because um, as I already said, the problem mainly is within some, at least some of the member states. So I think that with um, wider power of the EU institutions would be helpful in, in this way. Um, as, as Asa said, I agree that we need um, a framework or at, least, or at least that we would, um, do um, some recommendations at least at least so uh, i think that um, if i look from the slovenian perspective because i know that here is very bad i i'm saying of course that the eu should get more powers but probably some of the member states uh, where the situation is better uh, wouldn't agree so it depends you know um, from from the situation where you are but um, i mean i still think that it it would be uh, better uh, for the sector if the EU had more, um, more uh, power for the culture. Rosa? The immediate answer is yes, but it's not so easy because 
you know, greater, more expand, uh, expanding powers would probably mean changing of treaties. So therefore, we think what we call this framework, which I just introduced briefly, would be a really good, thoughtful, creative step towards um, talking about the conditions and the way we as Europeans would like to see our artistic community bloom and thrive. You know, what are the conditions that we think are fair and equal? What is it that we would like to have as a base for our joint European creative culture and creative community? So I think this, whatever you call it, uh, recommendations, frameworks, set of principles, development of, of, of um, ideas, of legislations, I think if we put our heads together, we could certainly start having more of a unified approach on European level towards uh, the sector. We've been seeing in ITM, for example, uh, that the support uh, mechanism to culture and, and, and arts through the 37 billion EU Corona response investment initiatives, the first initi initiatives that was um, established, We've, we've been seeing that being in some countries immediately put also towards the arts and then in some countries none at all. So it shows us that when there is a joint European and now a global crisis, we need to have some mechanism that ensures that funding and opportunities are distributed fairly throughout the European employment sectors, not excluding some sectors which are in our case one of the most hardest hit and as Irena said the first one to be locked down and probably the last one to be open mm -hmm. so yeah I think we, there's a lot of measures that we can take in this regard mm -hmm. and then I would like to ask actually Paulette so as just uh, also mentioned that of course the return of the audience is not certain at all even if the um, uh, two reasons first uh, people are afraid for gatherings, even if you open it, uh, they are probably afraid, especially those who are more most vulnerable, elderly, uh, who also actually perhaps visit more of uh, performances, I mean, compared with children, perhaps. So, and, um, and the other thing is like, of course, the, since the economic situation may uh, are different for, for different people, uh, first thing where they cut is entertainment and, uh, and the cultural um, uh, costs, of course because this is what um, it gives you, you know, it's obvious. So if you have to choose your lunch <laughs> or cinema, obviously you have lunch. So, and this puts another pressure for the sector actually. So, and especially the remuneration for the creators. So how can ordinary citizens really support the sector during this crisis on this, of this magnitude? Could you suggest something, for example, Paulette? Um, yes, um, it's a hard question, but what I've been uh, uh, hearing from Hungary, for example, their theatres, they were asking the audience member that the tickets that they already had to not to redeem or uh, we ask for the prices. So at least with this, they can support uh, the theatres. But um, honestly, I don't see... Uh, at the moment other ways because as you said uh, it's really hard to ask the people to to come and support art field when they are not able maybe to buy their food so um yeah i i at the moment i i don't really have any great answer to that mm -hmm. osa do you have any feedback from your network yeah, I mean, there's a lot of efforts going on in different ways of, of organizations staying connected to their audience. And we've had some wonderful examples of audiences that have been really engaged with their local theater or uh, city theater or whatever it is, um, or certain groups. Uh, there's been a lot of initiatives by artists going to people, as you have probably all of you seen on your Facebook pages, that there is all these artists that are really finding ways to connect nevertheless. There's a lot of crowdfunding um, things going on that we've been noticing. I have no overview of how large it is and what sort of, you know, wealth generation it, it is um, 
uh, generating, but um, that is happening as well. But first and foremost, I just would like to say, please, please, please. I mean, the culture and creative sector has been extremely obedient. We are following every regulation. We are really creating the distances needed in the theater spaces. Um, there's already theater is opening. So I would say audience should really take the steps towards coming back again. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I do not feel the theaters of Europe are gonna be the most dangerous places to be in. It's mm -hmm. more, the, more the supermarkets and the, and the shopping malls that I would be afraid of. I would be afraid of somebody scoffing in during the, the, the theater piece or performance, you know? <laughs> Well, if there is a, if there is a meet, social distancing of 1.5 or more. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just I'm referring to sometimes in a concert and there is a recording. Of course, somebody starts coughing. It's apparently this is something that people can't, uh, can't help and there's nothing to do with the COVID. But of course, it gets uh, now in a very different context. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> but but, but taking, taking some steps would be the best thing audiences can do for our sector. Then, um, uh, Irina, I would like to ask you, you know, obviously we now spoke, spoken about this, that, that the world is not going back exactly where it was before. It's a little bit changed. People habits are changed. Or the audience is coming back. I mean, this has, of course, led a little bit um, the creative sector to, to look into the digital solution. Do you, do you think that permanent shift forwards the digital realm for the artists and cultural institutions or any of these, these sectors could be actually reality now? Um, no, <laughs> I mean, not a permanent shift because already Paulette uh, told us the, the, uh, what, where the problems are with it. I mean, I think that they should um, reach out more online. Probably a lot of the artists already learned now in between, you know, um, how to be creative also um, on, um, on an online way. But um, I think that it, in the end of the day, um, it shouldn't happen um, like that uh, because as I already said, I mean, the measures and the social dist the distancing is possible in theaters or on concerts or wherever. So this uh, should be the, the, um, the first initiative step, uh, step to do it. Um, so, I mean, online, yes, for some of the artists and some of the sect uh, some of the cultural workers but not for everyone i mean it's not it's not possible so um now in these times yes but later on i think that we should think in another way also what do you think is there a possibility yeah, actually at least I just, yeah i'm sorry i just um, put in the in the chat box a link to a report the research uh, report that i um, published a few weeks ago based on a survey that we did with the membership regarding the digitalization of the performing arts. And uh, so it's accessible in the chat box for anybody who wants to take a closer look. But the overarching outcome of that is that our sector has been very resilient of turning into online virtual digitalization during this time and using it. And there have been loads of festivals and different events that have been held online, but people are seeing it as a temporary measure during this time. The performing arts can never be put in the same shape and form as a movie which we watch online. It isn't the essence of the performing arts. However, artists have been and they will increasingly do so and possibly there might be more artists that have now knowledge of the possibility of digital tools. But the performing arts have been using digital tools now for decades. So it is one medium to use, but it should be the artist's choice what medium they want to use. Mm -hmm. And Paulette, I mean, obviously uh, you, are, you had your personal story here and we understand that you're, you definitely need an applause and you, you perform really physically uh, to a physical people who are looking at, at you at this moment. And at the same time, you don't know when is your next performance is going to take place. So what do you think about this? Yes, it's really, I really agree um, with uh, Asa's um, opinion. And uh, yes, uh, we need this uh, human uh, connection when we are performing. That's, that's basically 
what makes more interesting and performing art itself uh, the thing for us to have this interaction with the audience and um, with online turning to the online platform it's um, it's not gonna give me back this same uh, feeling and it cannot be completely shifted but in the same time yes it gives an opportunity to until I will be able to again to perform in real audience until then I can use these online platforms but it's never gonna um, um, replace it in my opinion or in my experiences. Mm -hmm. Now I see I have uh, three questions in the QA session and uh, since the time is running out, I, I quickly ask for the first one and then uh, uh, I would like to know from the first the politician point of view and then from the sexual point of view. Um, there is, um, uh, Philip is asking, um, what kind of support uh, we should consider to be most effective to support artists a temporary basic income of a certain ac amount and question mark. Do you think that that could be a solution or would that be an easy way out and create somehow uh, the new um, new way in a way of um, financing artists? Um, I think that that's one of the suggestions um, that also a lot of um, people from the sector uh, suggested um, in Slovenia also and in some of the countries, um, the member states, it will happen. So. Um, I wouldn't see it as an easy way be out because it would be temporary because, you know, we all have to have in mind um, the difficulties um, that the cultural workers face with and um, also keep in mind the fact that, um, you know, they're not like um, getting rich and rich with, with the, their work, not, I mean, most of them not. So they are just, you know, trying to, to live with it and to do what they love. So uh, probably an income like that, a temporary one, would, would, could be a solution, but it's a political decision at the end of the time. So it's, it would be very hard on a European level, it, impossible, but from the member states, it depends, it depends on them. So, um, but some of them will probably do that, yeah. Or already done. How do you see this? You're asking me? Yeah. I think it is certainly one of the um, um, uh, ways to go and uh, things to debate. I'm just posting now um, what we published, one of the first things that we did. We did a national plea to governments where we listed 10 different uh, ideas of measures that um, uh, governments to take, one of them being universal basic income. Uh, so this is something that we feel that parts of Europe uh, artistic sector is calling for. And, uh, and I think it should be explored and um, discussed. It should not be whisked away, but it's certainly one idea. Another idea, if I may drop it quickly on the table, is the um, uh, opportunity to, um, for example, use uh, the existing framework of iPortunus, which is a mobility fund that was established last year. This could be used now to create uh, small, easy uh, grants for research and innovation for artists. That's something that could be done if we had the funding to do so on a European level, and I think it could matter a lot to get artists across Europe started after this very, very difficult time. Mm -hmm. So there are different ways to be an instigator for the sector, and this instigation needs to happen. We need to see a strong European will coming through about that, yes, we value the performing arts in the rest of the sector and we are going to find ways of supporting it and getting it strong up on its feet again. Mm -hmm. So I see that the time is running out and we still have three questions. I pick um, the one which is probably we haven't discussed yet. Uh, there is a question about uh, Corona tax and uh, support psychological and and uh, economic support for the, that we have a little bit discussed already. Um, there, is a, there is a question from Julio Fernandez um, and uh, he's asking, um, is there any opportunity in this crisis to promote any new program for young Europeans to improve their commitment, interest, or our common cultural heritage? 
Is that an opportunity, perhaps? What do you think, Irina, maybe, as a politician? What do you think about this idea? Um, I think, as I already said, this crisis should be now seen as an opportunity. So it can be an opportunity. It's very nice to, to see or uh, hear that people, the citizens are engaged and see the importance of the culture sector. So it can be, I mean, why not? We have a lot of programs so we can maybe also adjust or update um, the existing uh, programs, uh, it will probably, they will be updated anyway. So we can also have that, that in mind, uh, these opportunities and that kind of programs. So why not? And Paulette, what do you think? I mean, young people, of course, are using a lot of digital tools. So do you think that that is actually an opportunity for performers like you to, to engage a younger audience uh, first um, uh, over, um, you know, through digital tools and uh, once you're able to perform physically, uh, that they will come actually then? Do you think that that could be something? Yes, of course, that would be definitely an opportunity uh, to, to reach a bigger audience and especially the younger audience and invite them then later on to the theatre. Yes, definitely. And if I may just say one sentence, I think that is exactly what a lot of artists across Europe are doing. I mean, there's a, there's a very important sector in, in, in the community that is working for children and youth. And we have excellent examples of, of, of great protests that have been created. So providing the conditions, uh, imaginative uh, proposals would come via the artists themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, the time is really in three minutes. We would uh, have to leave and we are really want to stick with the time in order to allow people to go back to their uh, main job. <laughs> um, I would like to maybe draw just really a conclusion out of it that it is creative, se cultural creative sector really has hit very hard, not only economically, but also emotionally and also that the spillover effect is quite big to the other sectors, so that is clear. But at the same time, I was really happy to note down some of the, uh, some of the more positive adjectives, like um, there is a curiosity, there is um, coziness, resilience, resourcefulness, and uh, reflection uh, for the future uh, for that sector. So I think that is a really, really excellent uh, conclusion for all this debate, um, that there are solutions and as we liberal used to say, there are uh, obstacles and opportunities. We do not have to uh, concentrate on obstacles, but try to see the opportunities whenever they appear. And I think this is a very good um, end from my part. Uh, before you leave, I give a floor back to our uh, executive di director, Daniel, who will introduce you a um, little bit uh, what's coming uh, next. Thank you very much, Iris. And before I do that, a big, big thank you for this fantastic discussion to all the participants and to all the attendees for, for being with us here today. As I said in the very beginning, this has been a topic that has not been discussed enough. And I think this discussion today stands to prove it. And it also stands to prove that liberals are actually caring about the subject, as we see from our new MEP here in, in our group. Um, and especially as I've been talking to a lot of friends, especially theater directors in, in Berlin and, and in Germany, we have been talking about the devastating effects made uh, short and midterm, the destruction of stages and props that makes it impossible just to jumpstart again the work in theaters, for instance, and the lack of planification that is possible because nobody knows when it will start again, which is important to you know, get the ensemble together. And Paulette has given fantastic examples of what it does to an artist in those times. But maybe, just maybe, and that, that is my high hope, mid to long term, it will have a positive effect. And that is an appreciation, again, of the arts, especially of the performing arts. And so that people don't talk about, oh, have you seen the latest Netflix show? But I actually ask them, have you seen the play? Have you seen the performance again? That is something I would love to see more audience, but also to go back to a very old liberal principle and that's philanthropy. That people wake up and say, if I don't support this, I have seen it in the crisis, it might not happen. So we need to be engaged. If we want to have a vibrant cultural scene, we all need to be engaged and not only talk about how nice going to the theater is. 
So thank you very much again. As Iris has mentioned, next week um, we will have one more and the last episode, episode of Liberties in Lockdown in cooperation with a committee or oh, with a renew group um, in the committee of the region. Very important to point that out. And we will do a bit of a wrap up session to see what we have learned from the COVID-19 crisis, especially also on local level with the implementation of local mechanism effect on the local level and also what happens with social distancing in the future. I also want to inform you, need to inform you, and would like to invite you for the 25th of June, where we will have our first online conference, a day-long conference with different sessions with all our 46 members. It's called Idea Accelerator. We are invited to share your ideas, promote your ideas, discuss with us. This is not a conference where you just listen. This is a conference where we want your opinion on different ideas, to share your ideas. And this is, and that's my last word, a general principle of the European Liberal Forum. We are not here to tell you things. We're here to discuss with you, to listen to you, and develop liberal solutions for prosperous, united Europe together with you. So thank you very much again for inviting us to your home. Thank you very much to the speakers, to Iris for being with us this morning for a fantastic moderation. And see you next week. Have a good day. I would even applaud physically. <laughs> Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.